Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Watson Institute for International Studies here at Brown for the discussion of Peter Andreas's new book, Smuggler Nation, How Illicit Trade Made America. Housekeeping, as you heard the buzzword there, I have to mention some things. The way we're going to run this is as follows. I'm going to do a brief and perfunctory introduction. Then Peter is going to get up and talk briefly about the book, because obviously we doesn't say something about context, given that most of you have not read the book. This will become a stunningly one-way conversation. <laughs> After this, I will invite Catherine, Richard and James to say their piece on the book, and hopefully we can get stuck into a good discussion of the smuggler nation and all its aspects. At that point, we will open it up for Q&A. And the Q&A session, you will see there is one fixed microphone there, and there is another mobile microphone for this side of the house. If you wish to join the Q&A, please, if you're on this side, get up and stand behind the microphone. We have to do it this way because there is no uh, mobile miking uh, that we can use for recording for C-SPAN. And we do want your questions and answers to be an integral part of this broadcast. So there we go. Without any further ado, I will begin my brief introduction, even though it's kind of redundant because obviously I've just done an introduction while I was doing the housekeeping. Um, so here's the book. There we go. It's big. Now, for those of you who know Peter, you will know that this is unusual because Peter tends to write short books. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's great. But it's a bit of a surprise when you see a big one because you think to yourself, ooh, this is serious. Now, I'm going to say three things about this book, because I'm not going to get into the details. I want my colleagues to get into this. I'm going to say three general things about the book. The first one is, this book marks Peter Andreas's exit from the community of political scientists. <laughs> because it is disturbingly well written. It is actually enjoyable. It is quite readable and clear. It is utterly devoid of jargon. And it contains a powerful, salutary, and very political message. The second reason to like this book is that it is not devoid of theoretical, let's say, um, heft, rather just theoretical pretension. Because what it says, and he riffs off of a well-known um, sociologist who uh, passed away recently, Charles Tilley, and the standard uh, sort of model we have in the social sciences for how states get formed and build the component parts that they build is that states make war and wars make states. That is to say, you need revenue to go off and beat the living daylights out of other states. So in the process, you develop these extractive and administrative capacities. And how you do this determines the type of state you end up. And Peter's come along and basically said, yeah, that's right, but not quite. Because as well as beating the bejesus out of external foes, there's also your own population. There's also the people who cross your borders. There's also the people you want to keep out as well as the people that you want to bring in. There's the monitoring, the registering, the capacity building, the engineering that goes on with this that makes a state into a state. And we are remarkably blind, willfully so, as to how much of the state is a police apparatus. And how much of that policing has to do not just with extraction, but with exclusion. And how much of that exclusion has to do with regulations and regulations as to who we are and who we think we are and who we pretend to be in the world. The last thing I want to say about the book by introduction is that there is no entry in the index for the word hypocrisy. <laughs> but there should be. Because the moral outrage that is buried ever so slightly throughout the book is Peter's outrage over the hypocrisy of all of this. The fact that we have had a hundred year war on drugs that produces nothing except casualties. The fact that the United States was the world's biggest technology stealer throughout the entirety of the 19th century. Didn't give a damn about foreign patents. Imported whatever it liked, reassembled it and called it its own and then granted a patent for the people in the country who stole it. The fact that we are a nation of astonishing hypocrites is something that we need to come to grips with. I think that Smuggler Nation is a really good way of starting that conversation. So that's my introduction. I now pass over to the author himself to say why he wrote this book and what he hopes to achieve by doing so. Thank you, Mark. I actually stole a few of my punchlines, but that's okay. <laughs> Does it better than I will. Um, I thought it would be useful just to tell you a little bit about the book before people comment on the book. It would be a little strange if you didn't know. A little bit of background about it. Um, first, I'll tell you very briefly what the motivation was. And the motivation 
uh, is really that, that I can't think of any policy debate today in Washington which suffers from a more severe case of historical amnesia than discussions about border control, border policing, transnational crime, illicit trade, trafficking of all sorts. Uh, and the more I looked into this uh, area, which I've been working on for quite some time, I feel like you need to dig not just years or decades, but in fact, centuries. Uh, so this is a corrective of sorts, bringing history back in, if you will. Um, and the argument is really the subtitle of the book, How Illicit Trade Made America. And to my great surprise, perhaps satisfaction as a writer, I discovered it was, the argument was even more true than I thought at this outset, uh, which is you can't really even explain the founding of the country, uh, the American Revolution, the New Republic, uh, wars of various sorts, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a second, westward expansion, the slave trade, economic development, uh, border dynamics and so on without taking into account smuggling dynamics of various sorts. So we put that more front and center in the story of America, retelling the American epic through the lens of smuggling is what this book does. And there's actually a large literature out there on various pieces of this, right? The drug trade, migration, and so on. But this is a 300-year sweep. And so it's kind of a first take. It's, I'm sure it's a flawed book, as some of my colleagues will tell you, maybe. But it's a first take of sort of rereading the American epic and its relations and America's relations with the rest of the world through the lens of smuggling and illicit trade. And since we're here at Brown University, where I teach and your students and my colleagues, one thing that I found particularly interesting and quite dramatic and shocking is the importance of Brown University and the Brown <laughs> Brothers and Rhode Island a tiny state, the tiniest state in the nation, punching above its weight significantly <laughs> in the realm of illicit trade uh, from the very beginning. And the great irony that I trace in the book is that a country that grew up through smuggling, in fact, was given birth partly through smuggling, is today the world's leading policing superpower, the most aggressive, enthusiastic, uh, anti-smuggling crusader, if you will. So it's quite a transformation. Mark used the word hypocrisy. Certainly there is hypocrisy in there, but it's not only not in the index. I'm not even sure the word hypocrisy appears in the text itself. Amazon, if you know, you can go to search inside the book. I'm wondering if you punch in the words hypocrisy, does it come up? Because I, don't, I haven't checked. Um, so let me just tell you just a few minutes of uh, my time. Four stories. I can't tell you the whole book. There's 16 chapters and so on, but four stories. One is a story about the relationship between illicit trade and warfare. And all these stories, by the way, have contemporary resonance, relevance, lessons for today. So there's much talk today about the relationship between conflict commodities uh, and war. So for example, cocaine financed guerrillas in Colombia, or uh, opium uh, financed uh, mujahideen in, in, in Afghanistan or uh, ivory smuggling related to conflict, and, and we even call it blood diamonds, popularized term to describe the relationship between illicit trade and diamonds and conflict in West Africa uh, and elsewhere. What I do in this book is, is actually look at the U.S. experience in this realm and show that it's actually a very old story. The United States mastered the relationship between illicit trade and war long before we talked about conflict commodities, blood diamonds, and so on. In fact, it goes back to the very founding. After all, how could George Washington actually supply his troops without massive smuggling of gunpowder from Western Europe and the Caribbean, since we actually had in the colonies no domestic gunpowder production capacity? And who made the money from the gunpowder? Well, one of them was, in fact, John Brown, one of the founders of Brown University, who sold gunpowder at exorbitant prices to George Washington, and there's correspondence saying, you're charging us these exorbitant prices, but we have no choice but to do it because of the extreme circumstances. John Brown probably emerged from the war, American Revolution, the richest man in Rhode Island, partly because he was such a profiteer from the American Revolution. Fast forward a little bit to the War of 1812. Most people don't remember this war. It's an obscure war, but profoundly important. One of the main reasons the United States failed to annex Canada was it turned out we were more interested in illicitly trading with them than fighting them. 
So cross-border residents were, were actually quite uh, intertwined economically, not so enthused about fighting. And in fact, the British troops in Canada were 